I was starting to put a few things together, I was gathering a little material, and I came across the Pope's World Day youth message for this particular year, which he actually wrote sometime in January for um, Youth Day around Palm Sunday. And I thought, oh, I looked at it and I said, oh, that's good. It's about 25 minutes long, just fits this slot. I could use that. Thank God I didn't succumb to that temptation because you rock up and you program what's there, the whole text. So there we are. So, and uh, I will quote a couple of things from it though, as others have in the course of this convention. Poor in spirit. Before you, you, you look at what poor, we've looked at it, and we'll look a little bit more, poor in spirit and being blessed. It's good to know and to look at what uh, poor in spirit does not mean. And it certainly does not mean getting around sad and gloomy and heavy. And Pope Francis has reminded us often enough of that. And one of the lovely quotes, which is, I've picked up elsewhere, he said, don't be like bat Christians. Well, those of you who come from Darwin and a few other places up north, and even in my diocese, I came across a few bats in Karajini Park recently. I was up there visiting the parishes. And there's a beautiful, well, there's pools everywhere. And there's a 50 meter pool called Fern Pool. I always make a visit to that every two years and have a little swim. But as you walk through the bush, there were some bats there too. And they were up in the trees and they I think they, they sleep upside down, but you know, they're all coo cooped up and, and um, you know, they stay there and then they come, come out in the dark. So this is what, I don't know where Pope Francis saw the bats, but he says this. This is a Christian's disease. We are afraid of joy. It's better to think, yes, yes, God exists, but he is there. Jesus has risen and he is there, somewhat distant. We're afraid of being close to Jesus because this gives us joy. And this is why there are so many, he calls people, funeral Christians, mournful Christians. Those whose lives seem to be a perpetual funeral. They prefer sadness to joy. They move about better in the shadows, not in the light of joy. Like those animals who only come out at night, who can't see anything, like bats. And he says with a little sense of humour, we can say that there are Christian bats who prefer the shadows to the light of the presence of the Lord. And then we've had other quotes such as, you know, uh, don't be sour pusses. We, I think we're all familiar with that one. So, you know, poor in spirit does not mean that. And St. Teresa of Avila, a great mystic, but a woman who had her feet on the ground, she reformed the Carmelite sisters, and she used to say to her sisters, don't be going around sad. She says, otherwise, people will think that we've got a bad boss. So, uh, so we've got so many people who, in, who say to us what poor in spirit is not meant to be. And again, blessed. And the Pope, in his talk, actually went to the Greek to remind us what blessed means. And he said, it means being happy. And to be cultured, I'll read you the Greek. How's that? even quotes it. It's marry something. <laughs> no, makari, makarioi. How's that? Sounds Greek, doesn't it? Yeah. So, and so he speaks about that, and we have it in our readings for, um, for, you know, in our normal lectionary, you know, happy are the poor in spirit. So what is happiness not? It's not as many would say that it can be found in our superficial, material, throwaway culture of our present day. 
This never satisfies. Then the Pope says this, the absurdity of basing happiness on having, which deceives the young and everybody else. He says, we know what it's called, it's called consumerism. Then I think it's in his little talk for World Youth Day, I'd just like to quote this. If you are open to the deepest aspirations of your heart, you will realize that you possess an unquenchable thirst for happiness. And this will allow you to expose and reject the low cost offers and approaches all around you. When we look only for success, pleasure and possessions, and we turn to these idols, we may well have moments of exhilaration, an illusory sense of satisfaction, but ultimately we become enslaved, never satisfied, always looking for more. And then he says, it's a tragic thing to see a young person who has everything but is weary and weak. So, where do we find happiness? I love the quote from St. Augustine, 1500 years or so old now, but he said this, because he had this unquenchable thirst for happiness and he looked at all sorts of places and he says, into creatures, and he says, and you were there and I didn't even see you, but he, he ends up saying this, that you have made us for yourself, O God, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Or as Pope Francis would say, he said, says this, young people who choose Christ are strong, like all of you here, you've chosen Christ, you're strong, because you're fed with his word, and you do, do not need to stuff yourselves, as he says, with other things. And what about poor in spirit? Something simply about what that means. Well, it means that before God, I have nothing except my sins. And that I learned a long time ago. And it was good to have it even, I suppose, um, repeated today. Two people, you know, mentioned Pope Francis when he was, what would you say of yourself? He said, well, I'm a sinner. And he's a sinner who knows he's deeply loved by God, and that's why he's a happy fellow. But, you know, there we are. That's the only thing we can say is really mine. Everything else is gift. A few weeks ago, as I was travelling around the northern part of my diocese and visiting the parishes, and uh, some of our towns haven't got Catholic schools. A good number have, but uh, a good number haven't either. So when I can, I get the opportunity, I get into the government schools and you know, visit a few people there and the staff. And when I rocked up to the uh, counter of this particular primary school, on the, on the uh, desk in front of the, you know, the, the, the uh, foyer was this, this is a primary government school. Our values for the next two weeks are detachment and modesty. I said, oh God, you know. So I said to the secretary, could you tell me where I could find detachment and modesty? Saying, you know, goodness me, how in the name of God would these young people be looking at that? But the word detachment is, speaks about being poor in spirit. This means having things, yet living as though one hasn't got them. It means enjoying things, but not being possessed by them or taken up by them. Above all, being poor in spirit means knowing our need of God. Because without God, I have nothing. Without God, I'm truly poor. I am truly dependent on God for everything. And we've got some wonderful examples and um, remember Job in this morning's Mass, the, the first reading. And Job, some of you may have read it, and if you haven't, it's a wonderful book. About this person who had 
great faith in God. And uh, the way Job, the book is written, it's, you know, the devil's roaming around the earth and, you know, so God says, what have you been up to? Just roaming around. And God says, you've seen uh, that bloke Job? Oh, yeah, yeah. He's one of my good mates. He's loyal to me. I oh, says, Satan, yeah. But he's got everything. Sure, it's easy for him to believe in you. He said, make it hard for him and you'll see it'll change. So God said, have a try. And so one thing after another happened to Job. Catastrophe, losing farm and flocks and family and house, they all died. And there he is on the dung heap and so on. And today we heard, remember, about how it was, all those things were restored. And these beautiful daughters, remember the names? Turtle Dove, Mascara, yeah, gorgeous names. <laughs> Sarah, Sarah Moffat, if you have another daughter, there's another little name or two. She's not even that <laughs> There we are. So, but even through all that, what did he say? These are the words which showed how poor in spirit he was. Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I will return. The Lord has given, the Lord has taken. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Sure, that's real faith, isn't it? Real poverty. And I've got others there. How about a lovely woman called Esther in the Old Testament? That's one of my favourite books. One of yours too, is it? Do you like Esther? Got a bit of a smile. Do you like Esther? Beautiful woman, yeah. She was a, she was a Jew and the pagan king realised she was very pretty and made her queen. And, but you couldn't go to the king for any request at all, otherwise you'd risk your life. Even the Queen, even Esther, whom he loved so dearly. Anyhow, it was happening that there was this fellow that didn't like the Jews, and uh, he wanted to have them exterminated, and he, he you know, sort of arranged something fictitious which put the blame on them. So he got to the King and said, you've got to kill them. So the King was about to make this edict to kill all the Jews. And so uh, Esther's uncle said, you better do something about it. And she said, I can't even go and talk to him without him asking me. So, you know, she, uh, she uh, prepared a banquet or two and softened him up a little bit and eventually got there. But she was so fearful that she was quite faint. And before she went in to meet him, this is what she said. I am all alone and I have no one to turn to but you. That's real poverty and spirit. And then the one who shows us most of all, the one we know and love so dearly, is Jesus himself. And in the reading to the Philippians, or the letter of Paul to the Philippians, it speaks in this way, how the Son of God emptied himself and became as human beings are. And Paul said he didn't cling to his divinity. He didn't grasp it. He set his divinity aside to be as you and me are. Real poverty. And he went further and he gave his, he even accepted death on the cross, set aside his very human life for us. So being poor in spirit, there's some beautiful examples. And I just want to say this, because when I was reading the Pope's talk, and I thought, it's beautiful. You know, I hadn't thought of this too much. But being poor in spirit is important in our quest for happiness, but it applies to God as well as to ourselves. Saint Therese of Lisieux, and she was one of those Carmelite sisters again too, and a wonderful model for us all, um, she has a marvellous way of talking about it, the Pope reminds us. She saw the child Jesus by his incarnation, that we've just talked about, as someone who came among us as a poor beggar, asking for our love. Jesus is a poor beggar asking for our love. So our God in Jesus is truly poor. And then those quotes he quoted also from the Catholic Catechism, which are beautiful. This tells us that a human being is a beggar before God. 
And it also talks about prayer as something really beautiful. The encounter of God's thirst for our own thirst. Isn't it beautiful? We're going into prayer soon. And uh, that's a lovely description of it. The encounter of God's thirst for our own thirst. So we're not the ones who make the first move. God is truly searching for us. And when we are poor in spirit, we truly thirst for God. Knowing our need for God is the step we need to take in order to possess God and to be truly happy. Being poor in spirit, other good things follow too. And one special gift is this, that God can do so much in and through us then. When we know and believe God's there, we know that it is God who works within us. Even those small things, you know, a small act of kindness or a small action. Have you ever had the experience of, have you had it, We've, people have talked about it here over these days, when you've done something that's rather small, but it has, has a much bigger effect. I think Maya talked about it the other day in her reflection. Remember the teacher she spoke about? Whatever the teacher had a profound effect on her life. Hannah also talked about it and the effect people had on her. And Dr. Paul Starkey mentioned it somewhere. I don't know, I've heard so much it's getting a bit hazy, but I remember, you know, he said something to that effect. What we do is, what the outcome of what we do is well beyond the thing that we actually do. And there's many examples. So you've got your own examples, I'm sure, that you've seen around you or that you've seen yourselves that have happened in your life. Recently I was talking to, uh, well on Sunday I had the great privilege of um, welcoming uh, six people who uh, want to become Catholics. Or, well they're starting the ICI, RCIA anyhow. And they're searching not only more for Christ but for, for to belong to the church. And um, two of them are involved with the Vinnies. We've had a bit about Vinnies these days. And uh, one lady, uh, she was there working away at Vinnies and she uh, comes to Mass from time to time and uh, she picked up the bulletin and she booked herself in unbeknown to the Catholics who worked there. And she was telling one of the ladies at Vinnies too, she says, oh, she's, she said, do you know what? She, she says, the bishop said hello to me today. She was there at Mass with somebody I knew, one of the Vinnies ladies. So, you know, before Mass I know, so I said, hello, who are you? And she told me your name and so on. And, um, so, and that's all I did, but it meant so much to her. And the influence of the others around her working at Vinnie's, small things, but the effect it had was much bigger. There's another man too who rocked up in this six group of six, and he's a bit of a drifter. He sleeps in one of the port church doors, there's a little alcove, cathedral doors. And then he goes over to Vinnie's and washes himself and does his laundry there and so on and works at Vinnie's. Anyhow, he also went to the inquiry night and he was there. And um, the people at Vinnie's says, you know, you can, there's a little room here, you can, you know, you can stay, stay there if you want. He said, no, I'm very happy where I am. And so this, this man, but, but the kindness shown him, the priests haven't kicked him out of the cathedral or outside of the outside and the Vinnies have welcomed him too. So small acts of kindness but have had a bigger effect. And why is this so? Because it's the God of love who is working through all that you do and many good people do. All this that I've spoken about just now about you know, the, the, the outcome much bigger than the input. All that is about Jesus who said, I am the vine and you are the branches. 
With me, you bear much fruit. So isn't it good to know you? I'm sure you've got so many examples yourselves. And, uh, and just for the future too, when life gets a bit heavy, remember this, Jesus the vine, we're the branches, whatever we do, he's working in and through us and he's mighty powerful and mighty effective. On our part, of course, our, our role is to be the best of those instruments. We're a tool in his hands. And it's amazing how Pope Francis, while he, he speaks so much about the mercy of God and the forgiveness of God and all that, he hasn't got a lot, lot of time for inconsistent Christians, as he says, you know, people who stop and start, you know. You can say a few straight words if you've read them that he's spoken about. And he says, it's important for a person who is a Christian to always, not be inconsistent, but always to think like Christ and to feel like Christ and to act like Christ. And again, in our conference, we've had Dr. Paul Starkey talk about that. The, um, you know, his process was a little bit, you know, four, four points, but it's basically looking at a situation or whatever it is, the issue, and, uh, you know, getting into the context and so on. Then what does the light of faith say about this and where does it lead to? So he spoke about it. Um, I think it was Richard Mavros too. The beautiful, didn't he say that? Um, act, act, his, act upon, no, re reflect upon the action and then act upon your reflection and then reflect upon the action and so on. It's all the same thing. The YCW, the YCS say the same thing. See, judge, act. You look at the situation. What does the light of faith say about this? What would Christ say and think and do? And then what action does it lead to? And that's how we can be Dr. Paul Sharkey spoke about having a method, you know, especially when you're trying to connect and relate to people with different ideas and all that sort of thing to find common ground. Have a method in all that. And, uh, you know, but it's, it's the method to be very effective to and very Christ-like. It's the way to allow God and Jesus to work within us. Now, how am I going for time there? There we are. I haven't said anything about the kingdom of heaven, but um, you know, that's huge. And uh, <laughs> I'm not going into it now, you'll go to sleep, but anyhow. Kingdom of heaven means everything, as we know. It means God is, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is among you. And you can see it's obvious here over these two, three days, very much. God is among you. God's presence is here. God is close, etc. It's you and we all belong to this wonderful family of God. Now, not just forever, which is going to be wonderful, but here and now. And it's God's action, God working in and through us, acting in the world now. But what I wanted to do was just read you just one little paragraph from Pope Francis's talk. And he says it's basically the kingdom of heaven is Jesus. The central theme of the Gospel is the Kingdom of God. Jesus is the Kingdom of God in person. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And it is in the human heart that the Kingdom, God's sovereignty, takes root and grows. The Kingdom is at once both gift and promise. It has always been given to us in Jesus, already been given to us in Jesus, but has yet to be realised in its fullness. That's why we pray to the Father each day, Thy kingdom come. So I just want to sum up, I suppose, we being poor in spirit in order to possess the kingdom. And for that, I've tried to say we need to go to Jesus. His, he shows us the way he's our mentor, he's our role model, he's our hero, he's our God, he's our possession. And a great help is what we all know, and Pope Francis reminds us so beautifully, is the Gospel. You're aware that he encourages us to read the Gospel 
each day. And you may know that once at one of his Sunday um, gatherings there in St. Peter's Square when they praised the Angelus, he actually handed out pocket size gospels. Because he said, put it in your pocket. Don't know what the women could do, put it in your purse or something, but anyhow. But uh, put it in your pocket, take it out each day, read a little section. And he was talking to my type of generation, you know, who, do, who probably do that. But you, generation, most of you here, the young ones, you've got iPhones and you've got all sorts of other things. So, and I was at a workshop about the rural ministry and so on, and there's a whole list of places where we can look to the gospel on, on websites and so on. There's, there's sacred space, there's daily prayer there, there's Catholic online, there's daily readings in the Bible, there's xt3.com, there's parts of scripture there. And we heard from um, one of the speakers breaking open the scriptures with young people, Adrian Blenkinsop, and so on. The Bible according to Generation Z. So you've got lots of resources and you know. I gave a little, what I've been doing is now getting my little pocket one and I got the Gospel of Luke because it shows the great compassion of God and Jesus for the poor and so on and for everyone. And uh, so I give, give this now to my, uh, the people I'm confirming. So I received a 17-year-old young lad into the church uh, a few weeks ago, way up north in Exmouth, and uh, gave him one of these. And uh, I says, oh, thanks, Bishop. He says, I do read a little bit online every day. He says, so, so anyhow, so, and I actually have a little, remember the, all those oldies among us? World Youth Day Catholic Catechism, little something, a little, little, I've had some of those still, and I give one of those, I haven't got many left. And I gave him one of those, he says, look, this is, a, you know, about our church and what we believe, and etc. and the prayer. Well, he says, I've got the, I've got the big one, he says. So he's been really well prepared, this fellow. So um, whichever way um, we do it, it's important that we do it, because that's where we'll really come to know Christ. And if we are, as the Pope says, to keep thinking like him and feeling like him and acting like him, then we, we drink in so much about him in the Gospels. We get imbued, we get steeped in him, we get soaked in him. And it can't but just help affect us and then through us. It can't but just be that Christ continues to have those wonderful, bigger results, much bigger than anything we can do by our simple actions. Thank you.